halfway through my junior year, I got bitten by the bug, the startup bug. Just like a lot of my friends had, uh, I realized that I could change the world through software. And following in the steps of Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, I decided that I too would change the world. So January 1st, with three semesters left to go, I was more than halfway through with my college education, I decided to drop out. And I didn't know if I would come back. In my, in my eyes, I had this vision of success and perfection. How many of you in the room would consider yourself uh, perfectionists? Yeah, okay. And how many of you would say that your perfectionism has been greatly responsible for how much success you've had? Okay, yeah, so about, about like more than three quarters of you feel like a perfectionist and more than half of you feel like it's somewhat responsible for the success you've had. I'd like to share with you today how questioning my perfectionism changed my life. So I was six months into this journey into entrepreneurship and I had a product. I had a prototype that I had coded up all by myself and I was ready to sell. I had created this app that would uh, connect tennis players with each other. So if you're a member of one of the clubs that I work with, you would hit a button on your phone and it would connect you with another tennis player who was like about the same level as you were, had the same preferences, and maybe shared the similar schedule so you could, so you could connect and play. And tennis clubs would love to get this because it makes their members feel more like part of a club and it reduces their attrition rates. Or so I thought. I had this notion that this idea was essentially perfect. And so when I went to go sell it to my prospective clients, and I went to about five tennis clubs, I didn't get one second meeting. I got a first meeting because I'm, I, I'm pretty used to selling things. Uh, I started two companies before coming to Harvard, a uh, lawn mowing company and a snow plowing company. So I was used to going door to door and knocking, knocking down people's doors and saying, hey, you know, I've got this service and you could really benefit from it. But I realized that selling software wasn't exactly the same. What I had was more of an idea, and it was a good idea, but not exactly a perfect implementation. And so what I realized is I was selling this idea to these companies as if it was ready to go. I told them, this is gonna change your company. This is going to change your club into one of the best tennis clubs in the city. And I realized that I was selling a lie. Uh, what I had was not some magic pill that would change their club into the best tennis club in the city. Uh, I had an interesting idea. And as soon as I realized this, and this, this notion comes from basically looking at face, if you look at Facebook or you look at Microsoft, all these stories, uh, my friends who left Harvard, everybody tries to portray their startup as the, the most successful, uh, as if nothing's gone wrong. Uh, people don't really want to invest in something that might look as if it's a little weak. And, and so this is how I portrayed my company to clients. Uh, and it failed because my clients were, were afraid to ask me uh, about their doubts. They obviously had concerns. This is a big change for them. Most tennis clubs are not highly technological. And so that a lot of what I was selling them scared them. And basically what, when I realized this, and I took a couple months to go back to the drawing board, when I realized this, I, I became honest with myself and I said, okay, what I have is, is a really good idea. It's not perfect, but it's not all bad either. So I kind of ignored my perfectionism for a moment and said, I have something that could be useful to these people. So the next business meeting I went into, the next sales, sales pitch I went to, I changed my tune completely and I told them, I've got this idea, but I don't really know what I'm doing with it. <laughs> so, which was totally counterintuitive to the way I thought sales should work. I thought you should be confident and know exactly what you're doing. But I told them like, I have this interesting thing and I'd like to work with you to help build it into something that could be incredible. And it worked. Uh, basically, what Dr. Cuddy's been saying this whole time, uh, last lecture and in, in her book about presence, is that authenticity does beget authenticity. And 
it was amazing because as soon as I became authentic and honest with them about the fact that I didn't quite know what I was doing, they became honest with me about their concerns and they told me, they told me about the issues they, they might have with the idea and we were able to come to an agreement about what we would do to, to build the product together. And what I was so surprised at is that it wasn't only, uh, they, they didn't only be, come back to me with authenticity, but that also propagated to their clients as well. And so I would get calls at 8 p.m. Uh, with, uh, from my customers, the actual people using the product, and they would say, hey, like, I've got this issue with, with the app. I, I think that you should, be, you should allow like, times, uh, custom times, as, as well as, like, uh, as, well as like, I, I would allow people to say, I want to play morning, afternoon, or evening. But they'd say, oh, no, I want to be able to say I want to play at 3.30 p.m. next Tuesday or whatever, you know. And I got just tons of these types of calls about really detailed things that I would never come up with myself. I would have never realized uh, a lot of these things, and I couldn't have developed the company into what it became without their feedback. And that all came from the internal authenticity that I developed when I, when I stepped back and said, no, I don't have something that's perfect, and I want, and I want to make it better with people. So a lot of us feel that if we, if we set out to have a plan and we don't achieve exactly what we set out to do, that we failed. And in a sense we have, but the issue I, I think I see now is that it seems to go farther. And when, when we see that we've failed in something that we've done, it seems to reflect on us as a person. And when that failure defines who we are, it triggers shame. And that shame triggers dishonesty with ourselves. So. I'd like to, I hope you can take away from this story, perhaps, that accepting that everything we do is not all good and it's not all bad either. And that by looking at the things that aren't necessarily bad and not necessarily good, just the in-between, we can become more aware and authentic leaders. And by doing that from the inside, we can, that, that authenticity can propagate and come back to us as well. So by being aware of our strengths and accomplishments, we can, be, we, can become, we can practice authenticity with ourselves. Dr. Cuddy said yesterday that instead of focusing on making a good impression on others, we should start to focus by making a good impression on ourselves first. I'd like to amend that slightly by saying, instead of trying to be authentic with others, let's first try to be authentic with ourselves. Thank you.